Jimmy, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle show. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys for having me. This is I've been I've been looking forward to this one for a little while, Lewis, Kyle, ever since we met and got the chance to hang out. Yeah, I know. And this signed copy that I have here of the founders, which everybody should go buy, it says you look forward to talking about it. And now we're yeah, now we're here doing right. it. That's, That's right. right. It happened eventually. Uh huh. Uh, so Jimmy, you've spent a, a large amount of your life writing two books, one about Claude Shannon, one about the founders. Um, and I heard you say on another podcast that a culture gets what it celebrates. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, how would you encapsulate what our culture currently celebrates and how do we move that needle in the direction of what you've done in celebrating and bringing light to the stories of people that created something extremely meaningful? Man, you're kicking it off with an easy one, I see. Um, <laughs> no, and let me let me also like just take a, take a step back. Like, I, I'm not... Um, I don't want people to think that my books have an agenda. Like, I don't have like a, like a thing I'm trying to do with it secretly. There's no like, you know, there's no like, um, like advocacy role that I see myself playing. Mm -hmm. There are some writers who see themselves, I think, as advocates. They have a position and they want to advance it and they want more people to buy into their position. What I want to do is tell an story that is fun to read and that relies on research and direct interaction with the people I'm writing about to the extent possible. So like that's just it's sort of a I just want to put that disclaimer at the beginning because it's not like like I think I'm reorienting culture in any significant way or whatever. There's no hidden agenda. You're going to learn if you read my book, you're going to learn about how PayPal was built. Play, full stop. You're going to hear some great stories about Elon and Peter and Max and all these people. But it's not really like I'm hoping that you come out of it like a transformed person. It's not therapy, you know. Like let's let's like level with the audience that it's not therapy. At least I hope I hope it's more fun than there. Um, so, but to your question, like I think one of the things that I realized in publishing the book, particularly when I published it because it came out in 2022, early 2022, is like to, to invert your question a bit, we had gotten into this place where somehow business had become a bad thing, right? Like if you looked at all the TV shows that were coming out, like Uber, WeWork, Theranos, you know, it was like stories about fraud and like stories of bad things happening. And what I saw when I was researching the PayPal story is that entrepreneurship has a lot that's very inspiring about it, right? That like there's something very inspiring about somebody who decides to try to solve a problem, decides to stake out on their own to do it, to hang out a shingle to do it. And I think that that needs to be celebrated more than it is. You kind of only read about certain businesses and startups these days when they do something wrong or screw up. And I don't know, like I'm kind of like, wait, but that's not like at all the kind of vibe or the tenor of the conversations that I had with the people who created PayPal. In fact, they realized that like this experience was, it, it was hard, but it was really meaningful and the meaning lasted for a very long time. And I, again, I like, it's like one of these things, like I may have this all wrong. Maybe Kyle and Lewis, you hear this and you're like, actually, you're totally wrong. Like the culture celebrates business constantly. But often when you look at the headlines, I would say particularly the last like couple of weeks, like it's doom and gloom. And I think there's a role to, for people to look at a business that started and to see it as something that is like really an inspiring story, like the story of people overcoming odds, the story of people overcoming their own self doubt. You know, Lewis, you started the, a business last year. Like I'm sure like you have faced like dark nights of the soul, right? Just like not knowing how you're going to pay the people who work for you. Are you going to be able to get clients? Are you going to be around a week from now, a month from now, a year from now? Like that, that is actually, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of power in that. And there's a lot of like good things that come out of that. And all of my friends who are entrepreneurs curiously are a lot like writers in this way. You face the same doubt. Is this project going to work? Is this paragraph going to work? Are you going to be able to get to Elon? My friends who are entrepreneurs face those same difficulties and anxieties. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not trying to make a direct comparison. In, so, in many ways, I think what they do is a lot harder than what I do because I get to, as with that, when you write a book, you're basically a dictator. <laughs> you know, you're like building your own world and you can set all the rules yourself. But I think that we, we need to some degree to appreciate that there's a, 
that that business can be as thrilling as sports when it is written about that the creativity that's a part of it can reach a kind of art like it's like you actually have to be super creative and that the stakes can be as dramatic as anything shakespearean for the people who live it and and it does it's not all bad like it's not that you, you shouldn't cover bad things it's just we sort of tend to relentlessly focus on the businesses that screw up big time and we pay no mind to the businesses that don't. I hope to correct that a bit with the founders. Absolutely. One thing that Lewis and I talk about often is media optimism. Um, you know, you see like all of the sci-fi movies painting a dystopia no matter what in the future and the news is all bad. And, and what we try to do with this podcast is, is have a platform of optimism to encourage people to go out and, you know, accomplish their goals, find their people and kind of do what you allude to in the intro to the book, which is, um, you know, go out, find your people and build something interesting, which is what the founders is about and what PayPal kind of comes down to is just a group of people, you know, fighting against the world to, to birth something um, and all the birthing pains that come along with it. And, and to be the other, the other great thing, is that you see, well, I would say there's a bunch of great things in what you just said. One is it's not the same kinds of people who get together. Like one of the cool things about learning about Silicon Valley and about tech in general is that it's very hard to pigeonhole exactly who's going to be in tech. They don't come from one part of the country necessarily. And again, by the way, I'm, I'm, the disclaimer on that is like I'm writing about 1998 to 2002. I don't know what it's like today, super intimately. But if you look at 1998 to 2002, I've, you know, one of the people I wrote about was a former teacher who wanted to leave education. He had a friend named Peter Thiel. Peter hired him to work in, in tech. Ken Howery was an Eagle Scout. Max was a Ukrainian immigrant. You know, uh, David Sachs, like, was at McKinsey and joined from a consulting background. You know, Peter Thiel himself was a law student. Elon was coming off another startup. All the backgrounds I just described, you couldn't be more, they couldn't be more different in some ways, right? And so... What is cool in these business stories or business narratives is how do these people actually get to the place that they're in, right? And by the way, let's scrape away like all the riches, all the fame, everything else. What were they like when they were first starting out? What's the kind of behind the music stuff, right? One of my favorite documentary series is this documentary series called The Defiant Ones. And it talks about like how Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre met, right? This is like epic moment where Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre met. And I'm always asking myself when I'm taking on writing projects, like what is that sort of Snoop and Dre meeting moments, you know, like when did that happen? Because to me, that's like, there's like really cool things in that. It's like, I would love to know, for example, like Lewis and Kyle, like, how did you meet? How did you become friends? What prompted you to a podcast together? And, and I think that the problem with narratives that are only negative is you miss that like real stories of friendship emerge from this, real stories of collaboration emerge from this. Like in my story and the founders, you know, one of the most interesting pairings here is Elon Musk, I'm sorry, is Peter Thiel and Max Levchin, like this sort of duo of people that I would say are like as important a business duo as Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, right? Um, and I just wanted to know, like, how did they meet? And it turned out to be a really interesting story. I, I think that's like part of this too, is that business is not just about dollars and cents. It's about people. It's like actually about how does somebody like Elon decide he's not going to grad school and decide to go build a startup? I wanted the answer to that question and I had the chance to ask him. You know, there, there are all these little things that are not about like, you know, getting millions of dollars. Not that that, again, not that that's a bad thing. I actually think it's like really important that these businesses become successful and that the founders continue to do other things in the world. And it's great. Like, I think that part of business building is should be celebrated too. But there's a lot more interesting stuff, at least if you're a writer, that goes on beneath the surface and like how these people met. Yeah, that's been the difficult thing for us getting ready for this interview is like, all right, there's infinite things we could ask about, right? There's 10 people, more than 10 people who each are, you know, worthy of their own podcast. Many of them have their own podcast, appear on podcasts, have given hundreds of recorded hours of interviews, all of which are minimally overlapping and, and completely interesting. And each of them ha has their own stories. It's such an ambitious, uh, an, an ambitious project. And I think I like how you can, can you constrain it. You're like, I'm talking about 1998 to 2002 and, and all of these pieces just to like, cause that's the only way to like, make it not like an infinitely an infinitely large project it's interesting that you talk about the wealth and the the importance of the money and the comparison to you know charlie munger and warren buffett because like ideologically speaking 
in terms of like for this business to have succeeded for a long enough period of time, it like had to have solved real problems for people and like created new economic realities that like led to forms of transactions, like creating like a whole sub economy beneath them. And when you like think about the significance of not just the PayPal story, but all the things that came after in terms of like how important it was for these people to be financially well off such that they're in a position to take on these ambitious projects later, which created like, you know, I don't know if it's hundreds of billions, I mean, it is probably trillions of dollars. And I mean, just Tesla owns a trillion dollar company, or at least it was at one point, trillions of dollars in economic value. It's like m- much of the comfort of modern life. And in terms of like, not just comfort in terms of like nice conveniences, but like in terms of like, however many people are employed by two trillion dollars of economic value that may not have existed otherwise. It's just really significant. I mean, it, yeah, look, I, I sort of don't know what to say after that. But I totally agree with you, you know, like double tap, <laughs> like hard, like if, if you, if you had just posted a meme, I'd just be like double tap. That was epic. No, you're, you're right. I think, you know, uh, that's the, that the, the kind of second part of it, which is interesting. You point out an interesting kind of um, challenge with a book like this. My story really does stop in late 2002. I follow the afterlife of PayPal for a few years in the conclusion to show to show what happens to the company. But I was writing not about the, the trillions that came later, but about that first se- first series of kind of um, like the first IPO uh, acquisition, the wealth generation that happened there. So I but but you are right in saying, look, the butterfly effect of 1998 to 2002 has been enormous. I mean, take even one company that we probably use, at least I know I use on a virtually daily basis, YouTube, right? Like YouTube was created by three people who worked at PayPal between 1998 and 2002. Their their first startup experience, sort of successful startup experience was with this particular company. And so many of the lessons that they learned at PayPal were carried over into the YouTube experience. And like, and that's just one. That is one. And if you let's 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 actually even take it out of the economic value, quote unquote, right? Let's like set that to the side. Whatever YouTube was sold for, it was sold for. If you looked at the total hours of video consumption in a single day on YouTube, you could trace it directly back to this moment, right? So the butterfly effect of PayPal, even if we were just isolating for one company and one metric video views or like total hours of video watched would be, I mean, it'd be ridiculous. It'd be more than probably every movie theater in the, on the planet combined for a series of decades, right? I suspect. And so uh, to my mind, it was the reason the story was interesting to me because everybody focused on, oh, you know, SpaceX or Palantir or Tesla or Affirm. But the most, like to me, really, it is like the most interesting stuff about these individuals I found was like, let's say like the mid 90s, to the early 2000s. Why? Because they were just getting started. They didn't know if they would be successful. They were young. They were ambitious. They made mistakes. That's when the good stuff, like that's when the good stuff happens. Like now, I mean, like honestly, like, like their lives are very different. They're a bit more manicured. You know, you could say that like kind of everything has to be subject to like a test or like, oh, like how is this going to be received? Now, granted, a lot of them are very much authentically themselves. But their lives are just like, you know, they're getting more filled with stuff. They're like their parents, they've like jobs, you know, they, there's all sorts of stuff. Back then, this was seven days a week trying to build this company under the most crazy circumstances. At this point, they're essentially heads of state. Um, I mean, with the economic value that they command, it's the power that they hold. They can't just do any, they can't be 22, you know, or 23 ever again. Um, yeah. One thing that even, uh, I think as we were meeting, I like Googled the story of PayPal and there was one thing and it was like uh, Confinity and X being next to each other. There was no information on the internet that I could really find about that being true. And when I read the book and heard about it, it was just like, what kind of coincidence is this? So can you just briefly tell the story of how these two companies were literally these two startups were next door to each other and then end up creating the same product, which, you know, creates this vitriol and basically a war until they come together. Yeah, it's uh, in a story that has a ton of remarkable moments. It's probably the one that and your perceptive reader, because it's the one that a lot of readers miss. Um, so I'll, I'll take a step back so that your audience has some context for this, too. You, if you're listening, you probably use PayPal or you use Venmo, which is owned by PayPal. Um, 
or you've used PayPal at some point in your life. PayPal is today the reflection of like the union of these two companies when it got started. The first company was called Confinity. It was created by Max Levchin and Peter Thiel. The second company was called X.com, which was created by Elon Musk. And in early 2000, these two companies joined forces and that becomes PayPal. The PayPal that we know and love kind of comes out of that merger. But before that merger, there was this very interesting period of history in 1999 when Elon's company and Peter and Max's company were like fighting tooth and nail to survive. That would be on its own like a kind of huge deal. But mid-1999, when the companies are still kind of getting formed, the cement is still wet, they are actually sharing office space. Confinity is leasing its office space from Elon. And what's really particularly funny about this is like, one, these are very humble, like very humble digs. Like I had one, a couple of accounts of people that was basically like one working bathroom and it was like not a bathroom you wanted to go into after a certain period of time. Um, the teams, because they were all engineers and they were all working late hours, they would end up hanging out together, kind of taking smoke breaks in the back of this, this office. And what's, what's really interesting is, but, and this is actually like part of it. Both sides thought the other's ideas weren't going to work. And I, I tried to capture some of the humor of this because like when I was interviewing Elon, I asked him like, what did you think of convincing these ideas? And he said something like, oh man, Palm Pilot money beaming, those guys are doomed. That's over. And so he didn't think very much of them. And Peter and Max are like, yo, this dude wants to build like the bank to rule all banks like online and do insurance and mortgages. He's so screwed. The regulations are going to kill him. Right? So they were like pretty dismissive in the moment. Now, what happens to both companies is they develop these like payment transfer technologies and they end up competing against each other. By the time they compete against each other, they have moved, uh, Confinity has moved to an office like a few blocks down the road. So the, the, two, the two offices, in case anybody wants to like, no, is like 394 University Avenue and 165 University Avenue. So they're like within blocks of each other and they're very paranoid and very suspicious. But you are right. There was a brief period where these two companies overlap. What's interesting is it gave rise to all these conspiracy theories. And I went into this a little bit in the book, mostly because it was funny. Like I definitely was trying to be funny at different moments. So, you know, hopefully nobody's like offended by the humor. But like the funny thing about it is each side was like suspicious when they were living together. That the other side was stealing its ideas. And and it turned out that like like there was very little evidence of that like there was some suspicion that like Infinity was sifting through the dumpsters, to, like look for business plans. And like somebody else was like, oh, my God, we got to be careful how loud we talk because they could overhear. But like the truth of it is like it was like unnecessary paranoia in some ways. Um, but it is a quirk of history that at one point in one building, all of these people were working together in one place. And the truth is, it's sort of like Silicon Valley at the time. I mean, there's a like limited office space. It's very expensive. It's hard to find. People are actually trading like equity for office spaces. In fact, the first article in which Max Levchin's name and Elon Musk's name appear in the same article is a Wall Street Journal article about how they had to trade equity or like how these startups are trading equity for things like buying their URL or getting real estate. And so there is this brief moment in 1999 where they overlap office space. They, they move apart. They fight each other like crazy. And then eventually they merge in early 2000. That's such, yeah, I didn't actually know that story or I may have. Yeah, that's really, really funny. I'm trying to think where I had a question. I was just trying to listen and, and do the do the things in two different pieces. But what was the moment, and it's tough to sequence everything correctly uh, in my head right now, but what was the moment you'd say where PayPal was absolutely closest to failure or like catastrophe? I know there's probably a series of like challenges. So this is post, post merger PayPal, so like of the two companies. What, what do you say of like was the moment? Because something Kyle and I were talking about beforehand is, you know, asking questions about even today. It's like, the, the metaphor phrase that Kai used was like staring down the barrel of like other potential scary economic circumstances. And the story kind of goes through, you know, there's, there's time, there's parts of the story where times really good and there are parts of the story where times really bad. But what was like that most tense moment or in period in time? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I, I should preface it by just saying that there are, there are several, uh, there are several close calls, particularly early on, right? Um, which, like is consistent with the stories of a lot of startups. You sort of don't know if this thing that you do is going to work. What I would say is if the question is, what is the closest moment post merger where the company faced like a real existential problem or an existential threat? 
It's the summer of 2000. The companies have merged. They've, they're mostly in the same office and the finances are a total mess. And, and the reason is because, you know, it's, it's one thing to build a payment system online, but like that's the, in some ways, that's the easy part. There's this line that I have from Elon that's in the intro where he says the tough thing was keeping this company alive. And that's the truth because the summer of 2000 is the summer when fraud starts to just tear apart their balance sheet. So they close a really big round in March, a hundred million dollar round, which may not seem like much in our era, but it was a huge deal to close a nine figure round back in March of 2000. That round closes, but right away, fraud starts to tick up pretty substantially. So they're losing, you know, their estimates, but it's sort of like between nine and $15 million a month. By the summer of 2000, like the leadership team is in crisis. Companies like everybody's like lighting their hair on fire. The NASDAQ is, is torpedoing. It's like falling apart. And, and, you know, like they're like the mood is souring about tech. All of these sort of high flying like companies are kind of starting to go under and, and PayPal's losing like, you know, like that much amount of money per month. And so it was the closest, like there was a decent chance that if changes weren't made, if they hadn't figured out fraud, if they hadn't made some leadership changes, that the company got under within three to five months. And that was a very real, by the way, it's like, it's like not me. That's not, you're not getting an analysis that I made. This is like what I heard from like their chief financial officer when I interviewed him. Uh, and he ran the numbers and could tell that the math just was not going to work for this company. But part of that is there were, because Silicon Valley itself, like it had, you know, the, the dot-com bubble had started to burst. It wasn't like there could be some new round of $100 million fundraising, right? Like it wasn't like, oh, like we can just wake up and raise money tomorrow with, you know, our napkin ideas. That was, those days were over. And so that was the crucible. The crucible, I would say, if you, had, if you asked me to pick just one crucible, uh, which is tough, it's going to be the summer of 2000. I heard you say on a podcast that in the process of interviewing 100 people or more that worked at PayPal during this period of time, you constantly came uh, up to this point where they would say, oh, he's a genius. You need to talk to him. And it would always be a different person. And this is a, a we weird way of framing the question, but... It, Number one, is there anybody who stood out to you as just being incredibly intelligent other than, let's say, Elon? And then number two, is there anyone that reminded you of Claude Shannon? Oh, man, those are great. Uh, those are two great questions. You know, it's a really hard thing for me to, to choose in some ways because it's like I just met so many people and in each case, like what their colleagues said about them ended up being being very true. Um, so I will try to go into, like, I'll go into two profiles or sort of people for the first one. Um, I would say within Silicon Valley circles, he's very well known. Outside of Silicon Valley, Max Levchin is not like a household name. And I would say like, you know, he is one of those people that he just really does sort of live in a different stratosphere in terms of intelligence and endurance. Um, you know, he's had multiple startup successes. He's the CEO of another publicly traded company today called Affirm. Um, you know, photographic memory, just like unbelievable recall. Like he would, he would recall things. And I was like, what? Like, how did, and then I would find some piece of paper that confirmed everything he said. And it, you know, it's one of those things where you're just like, you really, you don't operate like the rest of us, do you? Like I, you know, it's sort of one, like I was like kind of consistently blown away. Um, the second person I would say, is somebody who like all of her colleagues just like would point to her as a rock star. And that was Amy Rowe Clement. And so one of the things that like Amy is, I think she was like the youngest after the company was acquired by eBay. So, you know, just for listeners like eBay purchases PayPal in late summer 2002. And Amy becomes like the youngest ever executive team member at eBay. But more than that, like before the acquisition, you know, it like could be fairly argued that she's kind of keeping the place together in a lot of ways. Like on the product side, like she is the one uniting like design, biz dev, operations, like all of it, right? And she has this like it's almost like a Jedi sense of like how an organization should work. And there were a lot of people that told me they said, you know, like Amy is like one of these people, like the company really would have had would have been impossible to succeed without her. And as I got to know her, you just sort of see the mix of like razor sharp intelligence just like an intuitive intuition about how to get things like finished and done. 
And then a real sense of like what needs to be prioritized to be done. I don't, I don't, I think even calling her like a, a, the member of the product team or the head of the product team, whatever, is like almost like a disservice. Like it really is this like almost Jedi level instinct about like how things should happen that saved PayPal's bacon in a lot of different moments. So I'd say those two. In terms of who is most like Claude Shannon, that's, that's a trickier one, you know, because it, Claude Shannon would never have really been a great fit in a company. Like he's just so his own person and like so going to pursue his own kind of uh, things. Here's, but uh, now saying that out loud, I have my answer, which is Luke Nosick. So Luke Nosick is one of these kind of, he's just like a brilliant uh, fount of ideas. And what he brings to PayPal is like, like it was this really funny thing, like one of his friends, Max Lepchin said when I interviewed him, because I kind of asked him, I said, well, what was Luke's like role in the company? He said, he said to me, he's like, you know, Luke is one of these people that he walks around the world and he, it's like he is spotting $5 bills on the ground and he'll point to a bill and he'll say, that's a $5 bill. And the rest of us will look at him and say, Luke, you're crazy. That's not a $5 bill. And then it turns out to be a $5 bill, right? It's just like the best description that I heard was like, he just walks around sort of seeing these opportunities, right? And Peter pointed out that like, not all of Luke's ideas are world changing ideas and he'll have maybe 10 of them or 15 of them a day but one or two of them are truly breakthrough unique ideas. And I would say that like in, in Claude Shannon's like broad mindedness of his thinking, Claude Shannon, again, for listeners, is the founder of the field of information theory. Um, he was a, a big deal at Bell Labs. I wrote a biography about him. He is kind of the reason that you can like listen to this. He's like basically developed the field of information compression. He's the reason you can listen to this podcast without having to wait like two weeks for it to download. And so it's the easiest way to explain it. Shannon was interested in computer chess. He was interested in gambling. He was interested in science. He was interested in math. He loved poetry. Like Luke has that kind of broad mindedness. Like I'd never interviewed somebody where we could be talking about PayPal one second, education policy the next, and like space travel and life extension. Like it was amazing. It was like some of the most fun conversations I had because you could just tell his mind would roam to everything. Um, so that's like an answer, an imprecise answer to your question. At what stage in the company's journey does it kind of go from like revolutionary ambitions to like serious ambitions, if that makes sense. Because I know like we were before we started recording talking about like crypto and kind of some parallels between like revolutionizing the financial system and maybe some like super ideological libertarian like beliefs. And again, doesn't necessarily represent every person at the company or the whole mission. But there's like a certain point when it like, I don't want to say like it's like sad, but like when a company goes from just like kind of a bunch of disorganized people just like going for something crazy and they're like okay actually we need to like make money and like this works so like, let's let's just like forget about abolishing the fed for like a couple of weeks and or years and make something happen like what wh wh what does that happen and like is that like a morale deflator or it kind of when it goes from like something that like seems like fun and like because you can just like talk about how we're gonna deconstruct the whole financial system but like then they're dealing with reality at the same time like what's your read on how that played into the story yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, and I and look, I, I would say also, like, I don't think this is a tension for just this startup at this time. Basically, every startup is probably an exercise in like dreams hitting hard economic reality, right? Like that go one definition of a startup could be you begin as a dreamer and you end as an operator, right? Um, like that's like one possible way of thinking about startup life. It's like you begin with high minded ideals and you end up like re having to deal with payroll. What I would say is that for PayPal, that switch happened very quickly. And I would say it's sort of between the summer and fall and winter of 1999. And, and, uh, by the way, I'm approximating here. There's no like moment when they say like, Oh, we're now going to do this thing and not do these other things. Right. Ideals live on within an organization in different ways over time. And they change. Like at some point, the ideal actually became we're really good at small D democratizing commerce. Like we can do what Visa and MasterCard won't do for super small eBay businesses. And right now, Visa and MasterCard aren't going to cater to these people. And we've got to do it because we can make sure that they're successful. That's an ideal. That's like an idealized, you know, that's like a, a kind of mission that can really inspire people and did inspire people. When they moved away from the revolutionary stuff, I would say is sort of the 1999 era. And the reason is they achieved product market fit and they achieved product market fit, not because like literally everybody canceled their Chase bank accounts and moved over to PayPal, but because 
eBay buyers and sellers saw this as a way to transact very efficiently and to deal with some of the clunkiness of like eBay as a, as an, as a platform. At that point, you kind of have to say to yourself, okay, we're not going to like destroy the Fed. We are going to become a really good payment processor on eBay though. And like, let's like band the troops together to do that. Right. And so you sort of like that, I would say that happened. And, and there's two, I think there's two interpretations. One interpretation of that is to like, is to be disappointed. There are still people, by the way, who to this day, who are alumni, who are disappointed about like clipping the wings of the big mission, right? The other way to interpret it is, the, uh, and, and Lewis, I suspect this is where perhaps where you're headed would go is like, you created something of, of lasting value that is still around today. You solved a really big problem for this market and then grew beyond that market. And you, you mainstreamed digital payments for hundreds of millions of people over the 20 years of PayPal's existence. If that's not at the final analysis, if that's not revolutionary, I don't think there are many things that are like what, what would qualify, right? Like I'm not exactly like it's like, okay, like, you know, it's kind of like if you've done that, is that not over time revolutionary? So I think, you know, to some degree, the debate is like in the eye of the beholder, like you could say, okay, they intended to be Bitcoin and they became PayPal and that's a disappointment. I don't think so. I think if you look at it and you say, well, they intended to be Bitcoin and they made it easier for people at a time when banks weren't going to do digital payments, do digital payments and figured out how to fight fraud and made a bunch of people really successful so that they could go on to do other things. I, I'm like, I would you know, like, big thank you. You know, it's like, that's great. Like that's. No, I don't know how that's not revolutionary. There is a moment where Elon is ousted as CEO. I think it's like his third time being ousted as a CEO of a company that he started. And he's like 24 or something at this point, uh, which is insane. Um, but he still talks today about how if X.com had continued basically with his vision, it'd be you know the most valuable company in the world. Um, I think paypal's worth like 300 billion so it's it's not far off but how did he frame that or did you guys talk about that when you interviewed him yeah we did uh, we did talk about it and it's interesting right because i'm talking to him it was sort of like one of those things you're like oh man this is like either gonna go really well or really badly either either he's gonna like be nice to me and like in want to engage and answer questions to be reflective or else i'm gonna like boot it out of his house you know um, and so you have to be really careful how you, how you approach these things, but he was very nice about it. It's like the kind of end of that is like, he was really gracious and was willing to talk about this moment when he's ousted. Here was his reflection on your specific question, because I said that to him. I said, you know, it's quite something to think about like what, you know, what like could have been or what might have been. And, and he actually raised it. He said, you know, I would have stayed at x.com and made it into like a global financial powerhouse. Like he's like one version of my life could have been that. This is an approximation of quote. It's like one version of my life. But then he sort of stops himself and he goes, but I guess things worked out okay. You know, like, cause, cause he got to do these other things that, you know, have other, other missions and other ambitions. And I have to be honest, like I, I kind of believe him. Like I think that he would have, if he had been CEO of X.com, he would have stayed and like fought tooth and nail to make that vision a reality. I think it might have delayed the other things that he's done. You can't ever run the experiment twice, right? So he's like, you can't go back and run the counterfactual. But I would say his own reflection is that he would have fought to like make it the company that he wanted it to be. And given everything else he's done in his life, I don't doubt him for a second. Now, what is interesting is that when he was ousted, and I included this in the book, there's actually an employee, Seshu Kanuri, who writes him a note. Um, who like writes him like an email because he feels bad that Elon's been, you know, ousted from the company. And he says to Elon, I'm again, I'm paraphrasing the quote, it's in the book, but he says, basically, Elon, I was very sad to hear about the circumstances under which you departed our team. But I assure you, you have more to do in technology, and you're gonna have a great career ahead of you, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so it was kind of this like thing about like, whoa, like, you know, Seshu, right, because obviously, Elon went on to do all these other things. And being, you know, deposed at PayPal had basically uh, probably actually a positive effect in that it freed him up to do these other things. But it was kind of it's kind of a spooky moment, because if you think about like like even that one 
decision in August and September of 2002, I mean, it changed so much in the lives of these people, right? Because it was like Elon being ousted led to him doing these other companies. It's kind of, I mean, I, I sort of get chills even thinking about it, like in the sense of just how different life could be, how different automotive engineering could be, how different space logistics could be. Um, it's just, you know, it's kind of amazing to think about. No, it's, there's so many amazing, amazing moments like that in terms of like what the, again, the butterfly effect could be the, the whole conversation. And that's part of like what encapsulates what makes the whole story so interesting is the butterfly effects of, of just all of it. Uh, specifically for the types of people who listen to this, they're generally younger, right? Generally still kind of figuring things out in their career. Maybe not sure that the thing they're doing is the thing they're going to forever be doing. And I think two parts of the question are like, one, I know it's important to you to like, as much as it's fun to like talk about like the genius the cult of genius or whatever you want to call it, but like to dispel that myth and be like, it was not table stakes to like be in the room at something interesting, uh, like at all. So maybe like speak to that a little bit and then also talk about like what the, the takeaway is in terms of like, and this is what Kyle was getting at a little bit in terms of like the introduction of the book, but just like giving it a bit more uh, nuance than we, we did when we just kind of covered it briefly. But like you're a young person who kind of matches those criteria. It's like, what do you tell yourself or what do you tell that person in terms of like, okay, you know, they don't go to Barnes and Noble and like solve puzzles for fun. Like they're not that type of person. Like that's not necessary though to like find something interesting. And like, where do they look? What do they look for? What do they tell themselves? And I would, I would argue, in fact, that, that there are many more people who are quote unquote, not geniuses, but are just really effective things that they did within the company, right? Um, and there, there's actually this great, this person, wonderful person I interviewed, who's quoted in the book many times, he interviews for a job with the team. This should just actually, like, this will answer both questions, but then we'll get into both of them. So he interviews, and the engineering team starts throwing puzzles at him. Like, puzzles were a big part of how PayPal interviewed its engineering hires, but it was really how they tested everybody. And they throw these questions at him, and he cuts them off and goes, listen, guys, I'm not going to get the right answer to this. Either you want me on the team, or you don't want me on the team, but I'm not going to be able to do this. And that's about all I got for you, right? And he ends up getting hired, becomes he was like employee 13. He becomes a really important part of the story. He still does work with all of these people in different capacities. He's like really very interesting guy. He was part of the business development team, raised a ton of money abroad, all of this stuff. And he was just very direct about saying like, there are things I'm good at and things I'm not good at. These puzzles and your random like logic games are not one of them, right? So there's no expectation that you sort of walk around the world like wanting to study physics in your spare time. And that's the only prerequisite for getting into PayPal. Certainly didn't hurt, but it wasn't the only prerequisite. I would say your question is really like an important one because it's kind of like, what are the takeaways from this? Like, why would you, what is there to learn from this? It happened so long ago. And I think one of the key learnings like that emerged for me and I think can help other people is that your peer group matters more than your mentors, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley and in technology. You know, oh, there's a ton of literature on mentors. Now you need a mentor and you got to have somebody who's like higher up on the ladder or who's got to pull you up, help you. And and that has a role to play. There's a little bit of mentorship in this book. Some of the board members are a little older. Some of the investors are a little wiser, maybe, arguably. But to be honest, this book is actually a ringing defense of why your peers and who you were around, who is around your age and experience and all of those things, like why that matters so much more. It's almost like, you know, how people always say, like, choose your boss very carefully. It, this is almost like a, like the book's message should be like, choose your coworkers, like choose the person who has a cubicle next to you really carefully, right? Because actually what happens is they don't just have an effect on your job at that moment. They can be the people who end up having an effect on your life for the rest of your life. There's this person I interviewed, um, Jason Portnoy, and he has a quote at the beginning of the book. And he said, he, he, we had finished our interview. We're at the end of the interview and he stops and like he goes, he goes and he says, huh, I just realized that my entire life can basically be traced back. Like my friends, my relationships, like everything in my life can be traced back to the decision to join PayPal. And he just like had this realization, like, as we were talking, you know, for a long time and it was the most amazing thing, but like he wasn't choosing bosses. He was choosing peers, right? I would say I was that, like, on that guy's LinkedIn profile yesterday. Oh, really? Super random, completely unrelated. He just like popped up in my life. He's the, he wrote the book Silicon Valley Porn Star. Did he just write that book? Yeah. Well, he's, and, and I would say just to sort of put a button on my point, like the, 
his thought about like how his entire life had been shaped by this group of peers is all the more reason for people to like actually be careful about the peer group that they have, the friends that they have, all of that stuff. Because really like PayPal is ultimately sort of a story of friendship, right? It's, it's a story about business, but it's really a story about friendship. So I'd say that's a kind of one thing for young people. And the second thing is like peeling back the layers. If you think about the ripple effects, part of what you realize is that like, you know, it, it is, it is often the case of like success, successful people will continue to compound successes over time, not always, but often enough. So if you have the good fortune to be a part of a group that's high performing, achieve something high achieving, just like don't fall off the face of the earth, right? Like you wouldn't believe the number of times I would get in touch with somebody and they would willingly offer introductions to their other colleagues at PayPal because they had done work with them after. Tim Wenzel, who was a recruiter, ended up being hired by a bunch of the people who are part of this company to do recruiting. Max Levchin's co-founder at a firm was another PayPal person. The two co-founders of Yelp met at PayPal, did Yelp after PayPal. So it's almost like one of these that don't think that the job that you're in is the last job you're ever going to have. And also recognize like when you're around really talented people who get you to step your, your game up, stick around them as long as you possibly can. Like It's not like those people are suddenly going to become slouches. I would say that's kind of if I had one other thing just to like go on this, because it's like a really interesting question. It It is so crystal clear to me after writing this book that part of what happened here is that people like Max and David and Peter and Elon and Amy and others, right, like they, they created a standard for success and excellence that everybody else like adopted and then was trying to achieve. And I think that's the other thing, like, if you're a young person, are you in an organization where the standards are high? Because it's really hard to keep your own standards high if everyone around you is kind of a slacker. But it's very easy to keep your standards high if literally everybody around you has high standards. And I had this, there's this quote at the end of the book from this engineer, David Gausevich. And he said to me, he's like, you know, one of the things that's like challenging about the PayPal experience is I just expected future organizations and work things like I expected the standards to be high because that was just like the default at PayPal was just we just were good right but I think hopefully there's something in there that leads people to treat opportunities a little differently by looking not at bosses necessarily but at peer groups and at seeing what the standards broadly defined are of an organization yeah and I think it's important to think about that Outside of, I'm a bit obsessive, obviously, right? It kind of comes to, like with the hobbies and, and the entrepreneurship and the podcast and things like that. But like, not saying it needs to eat into every area of your life, but it does in terms of like also your peer group is in like your friend group outside of your, your corporate environment is like equally just as important. Yes, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And it's one of the things where, you know, if you go to college, you kind of default to being friends with people who are around you. You graduate, you get into a job or you get into a work setting, you kind of default to being friends with like whoever is around. And it's the kind of thing that if you're intentional, you know, about even like one to five good friends, you could probably alter the entire trajectory of your life just on that those decisions. And weirdly, those are the decisions where we do the least thinking about that. You know, we don't like we plan everything else like we don't plan that. You know, it's a really peculiar thing that I, again, I sort of only picked up after I finished this book where I was like, wow, like these people, so many of them stayed in one another's lives, worked together, built things together. This was like no accident. I want to start doing some rapid fire questions. Obviously, we can still talk about PayPal in the rapid fire section. And my first one's thematically similar, but on the same point, right? And I don't like love hating on sports, but I do kind of love hating on sports. But like, I can't imagine they're doing March Madness brackets at PayPal. I mean, I just can't imagine that being a thing. Well, it's a fair question. I would say that the place was competitive about everything, right? So or if they did, it was it potentially just like not just. Yeah, I did. Or now that you now you mention it, I remember seeing in the company newsletter some reference, some like shade being thrown at certain teams. It was probably Duke. I say this as a Duke grad who's you know excited about the game here in just a little bit. But I would say that like. The focus was not so much on sports as sports. It was more on sports as a method for competition. But that was like, I would say what was vastly more important were the bragging rights that you would get with the weekly puzzles in the newsletter. If you answered them correctly and you sent back an answer, your name got a shout out, right? There were competitions around poker. There were competitions around chess. There were competitions around literally everything. So it was more that the ideal was competition. Um, 
I, I will say that, that, and this is to dispel an important myth, you know, and, and people have said like, look, there's like all these people who are like anti hustle culture. Now this group of people hustled, they work seven days a week. It was really, really hard to keep this company alive. It was really, really hard to keep the company alive during the dot com bubble bursting. And so if what your question is, is like, it really, it's, they didn't, they, I don't know if they had a formal March Madness bracket. There were definitely a lot of sports fans as there are in any organization, but it was more that like, there wasn't time for a ton of like, let's just hang out and do nothing because the company was going to go under if, if everybody didn't pull their weight. You know, I, let's put it, let me put it to you this way. I didn't meet many slackers when I did my interviews. I didn't meet people who, you know, I met a lot of people who worked super, super hard. And I didn't meet many people who were going home at five o'clock and just calling it a day. It's hard, right? Like, this isn't a bonus question, probably. But my first question is like, how, you know, and I know that's probably what a lot of the audience's question will be. It's like, okay, I've got these friends, I live in the city, like, how do I go out and find people who are interesting, who are, you know, competitive, like, it's just, uh, it's obviously idealistic to find a peer group that pushes you and you know is the embodiment of like vitality but it's just it's something that's not immediately uh available to everybody you know and uh, like that's one thing that i get a lot through this podcast and and with lewis being one of my good friends is just it's not immediately apparent to me what the steps would be to go and find that group where I'm at now. So how do you how do yeah. you break that down, you think? So but here's here's what I would offer. So I'll push back because I think that I think it's it's accessible to more people than you think in terms of like finding high performers and high achievers who are around you if that's what you want to do, you know? So let me offer sort of two or three suggestions. Nothing that really emerges from the book, although one of these does emerge from the book. People will be astonished at the power of cold emails or cold messages, cold DMs, whatever, right? Like the truth is that most people can be reached. I was not a like a famous journalist or like Kara Swisher, or, you know, or anything like that, where I was like writing about tech. I just like had a couple people who knew a couple people who introduced me to a couple more people. And I did that over six years and I got 300 interviews, right? With some of the most famous and interesting people in the world. I'm not anybody. I'm not, you know, in the sense I've written books, but it wasn't like I came in and I'm Walter Isaacson, right? And so I would say that like cold, the power, like never underestimate the power of cold emails. You can reach out to anybody and likely get an audience with anybody if you do it in a way that's strategic, that's thoughtful, that like leverages the connections and contacts you do have. The other thing is if let's say your specific interest is business and you live in a town of any population, there is somebody in that town who runs a business in your town. They probably have a ton of war stories, like over 20 years of doing business, and they can tell you a lot. And nobody asks them ever. Nobody reaches out and just like asks for a cup of coffee. And I will tell you that like the truth is that most people want to be listened to. They want to share their stories. They want to tell you about the war stories, right? So like, even if you live, like if you live in a town of a thousand people in the United States of America, there is a business in your town. There's a gas station in your town providing gas. Figure out who owns a gas station and talk to them about what it was like to buy and own and run this gas station. You will learn more in that afternoon than you probably would in a year of business school, I would argue, right? Not knocking anybody who's in business school. It's a good place to learn all that stuff, right? But I'm uh, saying- I like knocking on sports. I like knocking on <laughs> business school. It's, it's, it's all fair game right now. But so, so one is like, don't underestimate the power of cold emails. Two, and this is a new revelation for me. I am not the most active person on social media for a variety of reasons, mostly because the work of book writing is the work of like sitting for long stretches of time with lots of information and turning it around and making it readable for people. That is almost entirely in my way, my view, inconsistent in some ways with like Twitter, the Twitterverse. But the more I dip into it, the value of the tr of that whole universe for me is that I have connected with other people who are creative and smart and disciplined. And now I text with them and now I get together with dinner with them for dinner when they're in town. So the other thing is like the other reason I would push back on you, Kyle, and I know your question was sort of set up for me to push back in some ways. Right. But like on Twitter, if you have something interesting to say or if you have value to add, you could add value for a billionaire. Right. You could connect with anyone right like 
anyone in the world thanks to Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And if you are adding value for them, you can probably get a phone call. You might be able to get a meeting. You might even be able to go to work for them. There are hundreds, very thousands of stories that people basically get their jobs because that's what they do, or they get a contact because that's what they do. They just find someone, add some value, and manage to make a connection. Twitter's made that easier than ever, right? And like, it, that's like, like just that, that's not, that doesn't seem to be, that's certainly not accessible to a hundred percent of people, but it's accessible to a lot of people, particularly anybody with like a phone and internet and a podcast app, podcast player. Yeah. yeah. So like, that's the thing too. Thing three, this is like, um, the, the kind of the challenge of the, the peer group piece, right? Um, you have to actually want to choose friends who are ambitious and smart and not just friends who you like doing stuff with, with. <laughs> like this sounds really basic, but like you will grow out of certain friendships if you are looking for friends who are like growth oriented. Right. And, and like, that's actually a choice. If you picked five of your friends and I'm not saying I do this. So to my friends listening, anybody who's listening, I love you all <laughs> equally. You're all equally wonderful. But like, if you were to choose the five friends you had dinner with, you know that one or two of them, hopefully, are like growth oriented, interested in the same things, are trying to live their life, whether it's in accordance with a set of ideals, a religious commitment, a business ambition, maybe they're ultra marathoners, whatever it is, they've got something they do, right? You also probably in your life have had friends where like they're, they complain all the time, there's no ambition. You're friends with them because you love them and there's some part of the relationship that's nurturing or whatever, right? But like you actually have a choice about where you invest your time and which friendships you invest your time in. And as I get older, the truth is I don't have time or patience for people who complain. I have a lot of time, infinite time for my friends who are builders and they can be builders in art. They can be builders in business. They can be builders in like whatever creative space, right? I have a lot of friends who are writers, but I have equally a number of friends who are entrepreneurs. And I just choose, I'm like, I only have a limited number of hours. I want it to spend it with those people. So I would say that like, it's not, it's really is also just like a quality issue, not just a quantity issue. Meaning you might have one or two friends who have like the things that you're looking to be, like the things that you aspire to spend, spend, spend time with them, ditch everybody else. Like, you know, it's like, that was a value bomb. There's so much that was stuff great. there. That's, uh, that's media optimism. One other thing yeah, on this, yeah. the, op the optimism piece, which is I know people over, like, I know there's a lot of indexing on remote work and a lot of the value of that. And I would say that, like, there's some really, really good economic arguments about, like, if you don't have money and you can afford to live one place and be digital for a while and save money. But I, I do think cities tend to, you know, like certain cities around the world tend to draw certain kinds of people. And there are cities that are like accelerants. Paul Graham has written about this, about like why cities tend to be these places that like attract certain kinds of people. And maybe you can't live in that city because it's too expensive, but you can go there for a lot for like weekends. You can crash on friends' couches. You can do exactly what Elon Musk and La Max Levchin did and find your way to those places. Max Levchin slept on a friend's floor when he first moved to Silicon Valley. He didn't have anything. He just found a way to make it work. And then he graduated to a real apartment in the same building when he could afford it. I think he took over his friend's lease, basically. Very little. And that apartment actually became like a way station for all the PayPal people. They would essentially like live there temporarily until their first paychecks came in, right? But it's also the case that like you can make a concerted effort to say, look, I am passionate about the film industry. For me to have a shot, I've got to spend at least one weekend a month in LA and I have to figure out how to make that work. Or I have to move to LA, right? Or I'm passionate about I don't know, technology. So maybe it's Austin, Miami, San Francisco, Denver, Durham, you know, wherever. I do think geography and proximity, even in the world of remote work, geography and proximity play a very powerful role. I love it. I think it's a fantastic answer. So like you said, Lewis, value bomb. We got to add in the sound effect of, a, of the bomb. Uh, I want to make a couple points real quick. A couple things like I want to add to your list of like recommendations. So any city... If you don't want to just gas station people, like there's probably a chamber of commerce. That's like a very basic thing. It's like Kyle and I know this one kid from Birmingham named Sam who's 18 and he started a marketing agency and he just got all these clients just like by pulling up to the chamber of commerce and being like, does anyone need help with social media? 
and now he's like 18 doing it's gonna, if that kid goes to college I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hear him out why, why he wants to do it but he's doing really well and literally just like started showing up to the chamber of commerce every weekend and hang out with just like people running businesses instead of like his high school friends and then he hired a high school friend who had the same interest and he's doing really really well which is super cool and uh, approachable and then just in terms of like one small anecdote of like the you know anyone successful on the internet like add a little bit of value and like what will happen like the story i was telling you about you know when i was working for pomp and we had the job board like that whole story emerged just like that so kid colton who was the ceo and we had him on the podcast to tell his exact story as well it was just like pomp was like hey i need like some memes like ace on this topic colton's just a, a random guy sitting in oregon sending pomp memes he's like oh, he keeps sending me really good memes like we should have a call sometime and then he's like oh you seem really smart like this is a project i want to do but i don't have time for it. you want to right and that led to him like being the ceo it's just that's but anyway cool stories can i add one story onto that that's like a more of a personal story for me so when i was at um and this is just so that people don't feel like okay what if you're starting from scratch what if you've got like nothing i had a couple of alumni affiliations like i went to duke and i was at mckinsey and what i would do is i was shameless about using the alumni directories from both of those places and just reaching out to people who had even like a vaguely interesting career and just like asking for time. And, you know, I probably had like a 50 to 90% hit rate. Why? Because with colleges anyway, like you want to help people who are also alumni, people like helping young people, right? And because I didn't ask for much, like I was, I would usually write and say, you know, your career trajectory is really interesting to me. I'm, you know, I'm getting started. I would love to learn more about how you made some of the decisions you did, et cetera, et cetera. And they'd always give me 15 to 30 minutes on the phone. I never asked for more than that. And I got so much out of each of those. Like I would talk to authors who had done books. I had never done a book before. I didn't even know what it meant to write a book. Nobody in my family had ever written a book, nothing like that. And I would reach out to authors who were also McKinsey alums. And I would find mm, them, reach out to them and be like, look, I just need to go to school on you, right? And I would just go to school on like, that was like a separate education for me. It was just talking to them. And that is, I, I truly believe that's available to just about anyone. Like outside of the the worst off, like where you have like some debilitating medical issue or something, like you have the ability to do that. And I, and by the way, like I'm, I'm sort of on, I'm not on the other side of it. I still do a lot of cold emailing for random things, but I, whenever people reach out to me, I always make it a point. Even if I can't jump on the phone with you, I'm at least going to try to answer your question over email mm -hmm. or give you some guidance or give you a book you can read or something. It's the way the world goes around. And the truth is, in this respect, like people are far more generous than you think. Also, who cares if your cold email gets deleted? You didn't spend any, you didn't have to put a postage stamp on it. I came of age in the postage stamp days. That stuff would have cost me like 35 cents a pop, you know? Like you didn't have to pay anything. Like you just, you just sent an email. It's a costless transaction. Mm. I mean, Elon got to Silicon Valley and started calling people from the newspaper to bring it all the way back. That's right. That's exactly right. It's how he got to start in Canada was just reaching out to people. It's where he got his mentor, a mentor I ended up interviewing. He got him because he did cold outreach and he got lunch with him. And the guy was like, this is a really interesting person. I have an internship spot if you want it. And Elon took it. I would submit that like actually a lot of the idea that you can't break through in the internet age is just is really hard to believe, right? It like, you know, I mean, the three of us connected and like there's a the 20 years ago, we never would have been able to do this. And now, like, you can talk to and get to anyone. I, I, like, really believe that. This has been a blast and sometimes just a nice, it's been a blast. It's amazing. Where can people check out the book? You're on Twitter now somewhat actively. And if you do have, like, a parting message based on anything we've covered as well. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I just really appreciate you guys doing this. I think it, it's interesting to me. Like, it, it's... um. This book is in some ways designed for your audience. It is like, because I am writing about the moment when, I mean, I wrote about Elon in college and how he transitioned from college to grad school, grad school, uh, out of grad school into his first startup, first startup to second, right? So this is not the Elon who's running SpaceX who has a million demands on his time. It's the Elon who doesn't know what he's doing and is figuring out his life and talking to people and having conversation. So I do hope that your audience checks it out because I think it actually, they can get a lot out of it, even at the level of just being encouraged to send some cold emails. I am on Twitter. I'm just at Jimmy A. Sony. Love to hear from people. And then the book is available, you know, anywhere books are sold, but just go to Amazon. It'll be, you'll get it faster. It'll be simpler. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you so much.